Well, welcome to our next session of Baptist Distinctives. Um, and today uh, we're going to be talking about the two ordinances um, that Baptists adhere to. Um, and for some folks, this is the Baptist distinctive. This is really what separates them um, from any other denomination is one of these two distinctives that are one of these two ordinances that we're going to talk about. And so for us as Baptists, uh, the two ordinances that we're going to talk about are going to be baptism and the Lord's Supper, or some of you may be familiar with it as calling it communion. Um, and so we're going to talk about those two things tonight. We're just going to focus on baptism, and then next week we'll follow up with the Lord's Supper. And so we're going to look at um, why do we call them ordinances instead of sacraments. Uh, some of you may have uh, been in different uh, denominations that refer to them as the sacraments. Um, and so why do we call them ordinances? Um, why do we say there's only two of them? And how do we view them differently than other denominations do? And why do we practice them the way that we do? Um, and it's really based on what we believe that they do for us. All right. So we're going to start off with this question of what is the difference between a sacrament and an ordinance? Why do we call them ordinances in other places? Uh, they're called uh, sacraments. And so we're going to start with this kind of definition of looking at what is the difference in not just the way we use those words, but really in what those words mean um, and what they've come to mean. All right, So we're going to look at a sacrament is defined as a sensible sign instituted by Jesus Christ by which visible grace and inward sanctification are communicated to the soul. Okay, uh, So a simpler definition, an easier, shorter version of that, uh, would be an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. Right? So uh, a sacrament then has to involve some kind of supernatural work of God, that this is uh, the channel uh, by which you're going to receive grace. Right? So God has grace. He's going to give it to you, but he's going to give it to the church, really, through, um, or and then the church can give it to you, through these different sacraments. So these are the channels by which one would receive grace for both sac salvation and for sanctification, right? So if you're hoping to get grace, sacraments are the way that you would do that, right? So the church, um, best way you can kind of think of it, and this is an illustration that was given to me a long time ago, is that the church is kind of the distribution center of grace, that God gives grace to the church and the church distributes it um, as it sees fits or as God tells it to, okay? Um, so it may send some this way, some that way, some this way. So these sacraments are God's way of giving grace to you through the church, okay? So there's this very real sense that when you perform a sacrament that you are receiving grace, all right? Um, and this is grace both for salvation and grace for sanctification, all right? So when you use the term sacrament, it is not only just to make you holy, it is the act of receiving grace. And some of these will be initial um, salvation grace, and some of them will be sacramental grace, which means they are, are grace that you get once you're saved to continue your path of holiness, okay? So when folks really use the word sacrament, it carries with it this idea that since you are saved, through grace, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and, and they would hold that thought, they would hold that uh, just like anybody else, that since you are saved through grace, and these are the channels of grace, right? then the sacraments of the new covenant are necessary for salvation. right? So they put it to you like this, that you need grace to be saved. That's the only way you can be saved. These are the channels for grace. So therefore, the only way that you get grace to be saved is through these channels. So these channels then become necessary for your salvation, right? They're not optional. They're required. If you're going to be saved, this is how you have to be saved because this is how you get grace. So a sacrament is something that instills or imputes or provides grace to you. You do this and you get grace in return. If you'll do this, then you'll get grace in return. And so if you're going to get salvation, you're going to have to have grace to do that. You can't do it on your own. The way to get grace is through doing the sacraments. Okay, So that's the understanding of the sacraments. This is the idea of uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, the Eastern Orthodox Church would share this view of the sacraments. Um, I would go on a limb, and I don't... I, I would go on a limb here and say 
uh, that the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church are probably in those same boats. I, I don't have their exact uh, statements of faith on that. Um, but definitely the Catholic Church, definitely the Eastern Orthodox, and I would say the Anglican and the Episcopal Church there as well. Right? Um, Lutherans are on the verge of this view as well, but they're not fully committed to it. All right? Meaning um, that they would say, a Lutheran would say, that there is grace infused in the sacraments, there is grace received in doing the sacraments, but that that grace is not necessarily um, the only way that you can be saved, meaning that the, the these sacraments as they've defined them are not necessary for salvation, but they do bring the sense of grace. They do bring grace to you from God, all right? So that's why I say they're on the verge of this, uh, because they do see grace being instilled through the sacraments, but they wouldn't go as far as to say these sacraments are fully required for your salvation, okay? And so that's going to differ from the terminology that we're going to use. Um, the terminology we're going to use is an ordinance, right? And an ordinance is simply a symbolic reenactment of the gospel message. It is a visual aid to help us better understand and appreciate what Jesus Christ accomplished for us in his redemptive work, and they are testimonies that we indeed believe in Christ, okay? And so these are things that we would say are rites that were ordained or instituted, you could use either word there, by Christ himself, okay? So we're going to say these are not channels of grace. We're going to say instead that these are symbolic acts, which is a very different way of understanding them. These are symbolic acts that um, remind us of the gospel, that give us a visual picture of the gospel of Christ, that the gospel and believing in Christ is how we get grace, and these ordinances remind us of the grace that we've been given. So we would say that a, an ordinance is not considered a conduit of grace, but simply a practice commanded to be performed by the Lord. Okay, So this is not how Jesus gives you grace. It's just a commandment that he's going to give you. An ordinance is simply an act of man in obedience to God, which differs from a sacrament. Remember, a sacrament, we said, was a, a supernatural work. It was a work of God infused into you, okay? Where an ordinance is a work of man, an act of man, um, in obedience to what God has said, okay? So the sacrament views it from Jesus, from God down. An ordinance views it as an act of um a, a human act, right, in response to what God has said, okay? So it was determined three factors of what determines the ordinances. They were instituted by Christ, they were taught by the apostles, and they were preached by the early church, okay? Now, for us, uh, we would really focus mainly on those first two. They were taught and instituted by Christ, they were taught and practiced by the apostles. The fact that the early church practiced them, um, does give a little credibility to it, but we wouldn't necessarily lean fully on that understanding that we have to have the early church's understanding of it to be an ordinance, all right? So we would really say that those are kind of, it would add to the evidence that it's an ordinance, but it wouldn't necessarily define it as an ordinance um, one way or the other, okay? So uh, that leads us to the question, uh, well, who believes in ordinances versus uh, sacraments, right? And so most uh, uh, Protestants are going to share this view of the ordinances, right? However, it really kind of gets a little complicated in the fact that they're going to use the words of sacrament and ordinance really interchangeably. Let me give you an example, and this comes from the United Methodist um, website. It says the United Methodist Church recognizes two sacraments, okay? And when you look at that site, um, the two or the word sacraments is actually a hyperlink in there that you can click on, and it takes you to the glossary, how they define a sacrament. So if you click on the word sacraments um, on that website, it takes you to this. It says, but they define sacraments. This is the definition to you. It's traditionally a Christian ordinance manifested and manifesting an inward spiritual grace by an outward visible sign or symbol, okay? So you can see that they're going to use, uh, we have two sacraments, and then they're going to define those sacraments as ordinances. So for a lot of folks, they use those terms interchangeably. They say they're the same thing, okay? And if we have a full understanding of what an ordinance is versus a full understanding of what a sacrament is, 
and the purpose and the reason behind the two, there really is a difference in why we prefer ordinance over sacrament, all right? Um, because a sacrament is imputing grace, an ordinance is not. A sacrament is a supernatural work, an ordinance is not a supernatural work, okay? So, as long as folks have an understanding um, that these ordinances are not producing uh, greater faith, they're not producing uh, grace for you, um, that's why they use them a little interchangeably. They're not going to define a sacrament the same way as, say, the Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church, but that is the definition of a sacrament, something that's going to um, instill grace in, in either for salvation or to make you holy, okay? So we as Baptists, because sacrament carries that connotation with it, because it's kind of been um, defined by the Catholic Church, we're going to steer away from that. We're going to, we're going to continue to call them ordinances. Um, and that's the reason if you ask true Baptists how many sacraments they have, they, they don't know because they don't have any sacraments. Um, they have ordinances. And so um, we, because we want to make sure that we are clear, this is not instilling grace in us in what so way. This is not a conduit of grace for us. Okay, And it's also not a requirement for salvation in the way that we understand them. So it brings us to the next question. Now we kind of understand a little bit of a difference in uh, what a sacrament versus uh, an ordinance is. How many are there? What, whether you call them a sacrament or an ordinance, how many are there? The Catholic Church is going to hold that there are seven sacraments. Right? There is baptism, there's confirmation, there's penance, there's the Eucharist, which is the Lord's Supper, there is the anointing of the sick, um, which sometimes is called extreme unction, Okay. Um, there is also holy orders, which is ordination, and there is matrimony, which is marriage. Okay, so let me talk a little bit, just briefly, about these last few. The atonement of this, or the yeah, the anointing of the sick, uh, or the extreme unction. Uh, this would be um, a sacrament that someone would do when uh, someone is sick. They would call in a priest. A priest would come in, pray over them, offer blessings over them, allow them to confess sins to them. Um, this is extreme unction also in, has entailed with it the last rite. So if you know Catholics, if you are Catholic yourself, you're familiar with the, the final confession and the final communion. That When someone is at the point of death, they want to call in the priest, they want to confess everything, that's part of the anointing of the sick. That is their final confession, their final communion. That's the extreme unction part of it. Right? The other two, the holy orders, um, is dealing with ordination. When someone is going into the ministry, whether they are going to be ordained as a deacon, ordained as a, um, a priest, um, or a bishop, this is the um, sacrament that takes place, the ordination. Right? All of those... Uh, with the possible exception, depending on who you talk to about deacons, would also include a vow of celibacy for them. Okay, So th their ordination involves this celibate uh, vow, um, and so there's grace given to them when they go through ordination. Right? The other and the last one is marriage or matrimony. And so as part of the reason Catholics are so strong in their uh, defense against marriage, which is a great thing, um, and, and we often join them in that defense because they see marriage as a way to receive grace. All right, They see it as a necessity uh, for receiving grace. Now, you don't necessarily, even though they would say these are required, um, they're, they're going to run into some trouble because obviously a nun or a monk is not going to go through matrimony. Uh, they're going to go through ordination. And so those two have kind of played off of each other. Well, you don't have this one. You can have grace this way. Okay. Um, so those are the conduits of grace. Now, they have gone as far to say that if you don't believe that these are the seven sacraments, then basically you're in big trouble, okay? So they say this, and this is their statement um, from the Council of Trent, that if anyone saith that the sacraments of the new law, or the new testament, or the new covenant, uh, were not all instituted by Christ our Lord, or that they were more or less than seven to wit, and then they list them out, all right? So instead of just list them out, I put the three dots there. Or even that any one of these seven is not truly and properly a sacrament, let him be anathema, all right? Let him be cursed or let him be excommunicated, okay? Let him be thrown out of the church. And so this is the response when the Protestants started the Reformation um, and they questioned this idea of these seven sacraments. So they had held these seven sacraments, 
and then the Protestants said, no, 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 there's really not seven. Um, there's only two that we need to pay attention to. And so this was their response, that if anybody says that these are not the seven, and these seven are not correct, um, then basically you are cursed. You are thrown out of the church. You'll be excommunicated, right? Which causes a problem uh, for pretty much anybody who is not Catholic, okay? Because um, any, this curse would extend to anybody in the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, because they actually have more than seven sacraments. They would include those seven, but they would also include things um, such as prayers or worship or things that are, are we would not necessarily list as a sacrament. They include those in this is a way that you receive grace. You can receive grace in your prayers. You can receive grace in uh, blessings from a priest, those kind of things. Um, and so they would include way more than seven uh, sacraments. Um, this would include, the curse would include most Protestants or really all Protestants uh, because most Protestants are going to hold that there are only two ordinances. There's only baptism and the Lord's Supper. Right? There are a few that will hold to three ordinances. And again, um, I would say that Lutherans are kind of a, a mix here because some will say that is three ordinances, some will say that's three sacraments, um, but they would hold the, the third ordinance, ordinance is confirmation. So they would say you have baptism, you have the Lord's Supper, and you have confirmation, okay? Um, and there are lots of other denominations that will have confirmation. They may not consider it an ordinance um, per se, and they don't list them that way. For example, the United Methodist Church, you can go through confirmation with them, uh, but they don't list confirmation as an ordinance or a sacrament. Um, many Presbyterians will go through confirmation, um, but they won't list that as an ordinance. Lutherans, um, some will, some won't list it as an ordinance or even as a sacrament. Okay, So they're kind of a mixed one. Some include it, some don't. Another one that doesn't get talked about very much is a third ordinance of foot washing. So there are some groups that will say there are three ordinances. There are baptism, the Lord's Supper, and foot washing, okay? And so this would be the Adventist group. Um, so seven-day Adventists. There are even some uh, non-seven-day Adventists, but they would be um, in that same category, all right? The Anabaptist, which would include um, many of the... Um, Mennonites, Amish, those kind of things, they would say that Christ uh, in, instituted or in, um, he um, ordained um, foot washing as well when he washed the disciples' feet. Um, so there are some in the Anabaptist movement that would follow that. There are some Baptist, uh, mainly the free will Baptist, that would follow that. And there are some Pentecostals that would follow that movement as well, that there are three ordinances instead of two. And so it may sound a little odd that say, uh, two ordinances are Baptist distinctive, and yet we have some Baptists that are saying there are three, okay? Um, so we're going to stick with kind of the traditional uh, two ordinances kind of throughout history. Uh, the vast, vast, vast majority of Baptists have said there are two ordinances, okay? And so we're going to talk about those two ordinances because the way we practice them um, has to do with what we believe about them, all right? Um, and, and so there are a lot of folks that are going to say, this is the Baptist distinctive. This is what most folks would say makes a Baptist church a Baptist church, okay? So we're going to, talk, again, talk about baptism tonight and talk about um, the Lord's Supper um, or communion, however you want to call it, uh, next week. But baptism is a practice, um, and it's practiced very differently across denominational lines. Right? And it differs both in the meaning and purpose of baptism, um, and that makes a difference in when should someone be baptized. Okay, So what we believe about baptism determines how we practice it. Okay, What we believe about what it does and what it means makes a difference in when we allow someone to be baptized and when we would encourage someone to be baptized. The second question that we work with is the mode of baptism. All right? So not only when should someone be baptized, but how. What's the mode or what's the method by which someone should be baptized? And like I said, for a lot of folks, they would say this is what makes Baptist Baptist because Baptist, this is honestly um, the one thing that is going to differ for us versus pretty much, pretty much, not every single one, but pretty much every other denomination. The way that we believe baptism and, and practice baptism and when we practice baptism is vastly different uh, because of what we believe about it versus a lot of other denominations. In fact, most other denominations, okay?
So um, when we talk about baptism and this idea of when somebody should be baptized and the meaning of baptism, um, you probably have seen folks fall in one of these categories because Christians have been split over when somebody should be baptized. And it's either your pedo baptism um, or a credo baptism. All right, it means that you either believe in infant or child baptism, or a credo baptism is someone who um, believes in in a believer's baptism, or they have made a confession to a creed. And they 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 are doing it on their belief. Uh, pedo pedo uh, baptism is pedo child, uh, the Greek for child or infant, um, and so a pedo baptism would encourage infant or child baptism, really infant baptism, um, and credo baptism would be believer's baptism. And these two practices have really more to do with what we believe happens during baptism or why somebody should get baptized rather than an age, okay? Because there are, are Baptists who believe in credo baptism that would baptize someone at a very, very young age, okay? Even we would consider them children. We would not do it as an infant. And so we're not necessarily entitled or uh, getting in, tied up into an age here as much as the reason we would do it or the... Um, the meaning that we see behind it, all right? So, there are folks that believe, um, for those that are uh, paedo-baptists, that they're going to believe that you should be baptizing infants, um, paedo-baptists are going to follow, uh, they're going to fall, excuse me, they're going to follow this practice because they believe that baptism does one of two things, okay? So, a paedo-baptist is going to say they, they baptize their infant because this or because of this other thing. One of the first things they believe, or the, one of the first reasons, and these two are pretty much exclusive of each other. So it's not that you're you're baptizing for both of these. It's if you're baptizing an infant, it's because of this, or because you see baptism doing this. Okay. So the first thing that they'll see baptism doing is it will cleanse from the original sin. All right. And they'll look at Romans chapter five, verse twelve. It says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, in this way death spread to all men, because all have sinned. All right. So um, we would believe in original sin. This is the idea that everyone has original sin, that when Adam sinned, his sin, um, both Adam and Eve, the original sin has been passed down to all humanity. All right? That sin entered through one man and death through sin. All right? So this is spread to everybody. Uh, basically this idea that you are guilty of sin before you were ever born. And this sin has to be removed after you're born. Okay, So everybody would say that you are guilty of sin, that because of what Adam and Eve did, original sin, they are the father and mother of, of all humanity, they pass that sin down to everybody else. Okay, And so um, baptism becomes a way of removing that original sin. So when you were born, you were guilty of original sin. So they will do infant baptism because the baptism will cleanse away or wash away that original sin. So you are no longer guilty of the sins that were committed by humanity or the sins that were committed uh, before your birth, okay? Because uh, you're not responsible for those anymore because you've been baptized, right? Uh, so they would say um, that without this cleansing, one cannot be saved, all right? The, this is necessary for your salvation because you have sin. Sin cannot enter the presence of God. Um, so without this cleansing you cannot be saved. So you cannot be saved because you haven't had this. All right? So it cleanses you from original sin. It infuses you with grace and you become a member of the body of Christ. Okay. Um, so they would continue on that you've got to have this to be saved. Um, this is again a sacrament. So it's infusing grace to you and it becomes, this is how you become a member of the body of Christ. You become a member of the church at this point, okay? So those are part of the things they would add to the idea of pedo baptism and cleansing of the original sin. But then they go on to um, say this. Sorry, I was trying to look at my slides. Um, that this is also how you receive and when someone receives the Holy Spirit, right? And so the reason you would have to have grace or the reason this would allow you to be saved is because basically you are a sinner, so you are uh, turned away from God because you're an original sinner. You are washed from that sin. At that moment, you allow the Holy Spirit to come in you, which inclines you towards Christ, to entwines you or um, in turn 
points you or inclines your heart towards God. And so they're going to look at Acts chapter 2, verse 28, and say, um, this says, Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, So this is where they're going to tie this in, that the Holy Spirit comes upon you when baptism is practiced. And so um, Peter telling them, you repent, be baptized, and you'll receive the forgiveness of your sin and the Holy Spirit. Okay, And so then their thought argument goes like this, that why would anyone want to deny infants and children the incredible gifts received through baptism? Right. So if baptism washes away our original sin, if baptism gives us grace, if baptism brings the Holy Spirit into us, if baptism turns us in, in in, in uh, turns us towards God, then why would we want that for our kid? And by the way, it's also required for salvation. So if your kid is not baptized, then shame on you because you didn't provide for your child's, you didn't provide grace for your child um, that was needed for salvation. All right, so there's a trouble for you right there. That's a problem. So they go to this question, and this is actually a, a very question they would use. Why would anyone want to deny infants and children the incredible gifts are received through baptism. In essence, if you think it's good for you, then why wouldn't it be good for your kid? All right? You should make this available for your kid. All right? So, um, they would go on to say, or excuse me, uh, groups that believe this would be, uh, this would be the position of the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Anglican Church, and the Episcopal Church. All right? So, those four are fully enveloped in this idea of the cleansing of original sin. All right? Other groups, such as the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Wesleyans, the Moravians, uh, they believe this also um, to the extent um, that it does remove original sin. Okay, So those four groups, the, the Lutherans, the Methodists, the Wesleyans, the Moravians, they're going to believe that you, re, you do get rid of your original sin this way, but they're not going to say um, that this is receiving grace. So they're not going to go to the point of a sacrament that you get grace from this, but they are going to say this is how you get washed from original sin. Okay. Now there's another group that practices pedo baptism, and they do it for a different reason. Right? For this group, they're going to practice pedo baptism uh, because for them, this is an incorporation into a covenant community. It is a means of grace by which God provides a promise to its recipients. Okay, So they would say that an infant is not saved, rather they incorporate it into a covenant community in which they will hear the gospel and are heirs to a covenant promise. All right? baptism, baptism is a divinely appointed sign and seal. Okay, So this is going to be very different. They're, they're not going to say that this is going to make someone saved. What they're going to say is this is the initiation of someone into um, a covenant community into someone who is into a family or to a group that is part of the covenant, which is a promise that God has made. Right. So basically, when you go through infant baptism under this belief, you're signing and sealing this child that one day this child will become a member um, of the body of Christ. Okay, because. They are part of the promise of God. So they see it not as a removing sin as much as the promise that one day that sin is going to be removed. A promise that, that you're in this covenant, you're in this group that God has made a promise to, and that you're going to have your sins removed one day. It doesn't do it right then, but one day you're going to have that removed. Okay, And so um, this group would say that this is really a replacement of circumcision in the Old Testament. Okay. And so in the Old Testament, they have this idea of federal holiness, right? That you are holy because you're a part of a group that receives grace and is acting holy, right? So for example, uh, not example, this is, this is their thought. The nation of Israel in the Old Testament, right? When Abraham um, was talking with God, God promised him, uh, gave him a covenant that he would bless him and his offspring, okay? So if you were a part of Abraham's offspring, you were part of the nation of Israel, you were automatically part of the covenant that God gave to Abraham. You didn't have to earn it. You didn't have to work for it. You didn't have to change anything. You just inherited it, really. You just became part of it 
because of who you were, all right? Because of the way you were born or the, the family you were born into. So the nation of Israel in the Old Testament has now been replaced by the church and the Christian household in the New Testament. So uh, the church or the Christian households, people who are Christians, their household, now become the recipients of that promise, right? So uh, me, as a father, uh, would receive a promise. I would receive a covenant from God that I believe in God, I believe in Christ, and so there's a promise made to me um, that's also inherited to my children, to my household, okay? So baptism for them is the incorporation of that. And so in the Old Testament, folks were incorporated or, or signed, and it was a symbol for them to go through circumcision in the Old Testament. Well, we've replaced that now. Instead of requiring circumcision, we're going to require baptism, or we're going to have baptism, because that's the seal or the sign that you're part of this Christian group, that you're part of the covenant that God says, right? So the covenant of grace, by virtue of being an unbeliever's household, therefore, without any controversy, the infant of believers are to be baptized, okay? Because you're a believer, the covenant goes to your children, and so as a believer, you need to have your children baptized as well, your infants baptized as well, okay? And so the groups that are going to... Um, or excuse me, something else they're going to add to their uh, discussion for this is they're going to say that in the New Testament, every time there was a person who became a Christian and had a family, there was a household baptism, right? So they're going to give three examples for this. They're going to say Lydia in Acts chapter 16, the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, and Stephanos, uh, which is baptized by Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 16. And Paul says that I baptized his household, Okay. Um, so they're going to say that when you have a believer, in fact, this is a direct quote from um, a Presbyterian website, that every time a person who is a Christian has a family, their household becomes baptized. There's a whole baptism of their entire household. Right? So groups that are going to hold this um, are going to be two major groups, right? the Presbyterians and the Reformed. Right? So if you are a member of the Presbyterian Church, this is what it is. If you're a member of Reformed Church, this is the belief that is there, right? So these two groups are going to hold this position. However, that's not the only position of baptism. Those are the only two positions of a paedo baptist Either you baptize your infant because you believe it gets rid of original sin and is required to get to heaven, or you baptize them as a promise that this is now sealed, that they are now going to be in the covenant of your family or the covenant of your church, okay? So that's why people would baptize an infant, right? However, for Baptist, we believe in what we call credo baptism, right? And credo baptism is very different. You may have heard it as believer's baptism. Baptism is only for those who offer a credo or excuse me, a credible personal profession of faith in Christ. It means someone has to be a believer in Christ, chooses to be baptized in order to give testimony of their faith. It is a symbol, it is a symbol of one's adopting a certain doctrine or or creed, and it does not impart grace, and it does not cleanse someone from sin, okay? So it's not going to um, wash you of original sin. It's not going to impart grace to you. You do this after you've received grace enough to become a Christian, after you have made a commitment. So it's not so much you're sealed as much as you are making a declaration. You are declaring this is what I believe. This is what I follow. And there is no question about it from this point on. This is what I believe. Um, so, for a credo Baptist or someone who believes in believer's baptism, um, this is a choice made by the individual. Uh, the baptism only follows confession and repentance. All right? That since an infant, so someone who believes in credo baptism would say that since an infant cannot confess faith or repent from sins, they should not be baptized, all right? And, and so they're going to say that the only time you see a baptism is after a confession of faith, after a confession and repentance of sin, um, that's when you should be baptized. And so since a child, a baby, an infant, let's go back to the word infant instead of child, since an infant cannot do that, since an infant cannot make a decision to follow Christ, cannot make a, a declaration, of this is what I believe, then they should not be baptized. Right? So groups that believe in believer's baptism or hold to believer's baptism um, are held by the Anabaptist, 
Um, and by the way, Anabaptists is not anti-Baptist. They are Anabaptists because they were the rebaptizers, right? Uh, the Baptists and some Pentecostals. Now, Anabaptists got that name because during the Reformation, there were groups who, of people who were baptizing as infants. But they said, we don't believe this is true. We don't believe this is scriptural. We want to be baptized again as adults. Now that we are believers in Christ, now that we've made confession, and now that we believe this, um, we want to be baptized as adults. So they labeled them as Anabaptists, Anna being re or again, they were baptized again, which by the way, the Catholic Church does not allow uh, because it's a one-time deal. So if you were baptized as an infant as a Catholic Church, you're never to get rebaptized again. And so this was kind of a slap in their face that you were rebaptized or you were baptized again. And these guys were saying, well, we did it right the second time. We wanted to make sure it was right. Um, so that's where the name Anabaptist really comes from. All right. Um, so when we look at this, we've got to try to figure out which one of these two positions is correct. Now, you probably already know that as Baptists, we hold to creedal baptism, but if we're going to make that statement, we want it to be backed up biblically. All right? So if we're trying to decide between pedo or infant baptism and believer's baptism or credo baptism, then we've got to do it based on Scripture and nothing. So we're going to look at three specific passages of Scripture. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 3, verse 13 through 17, which is the baptism of Jesus. We're going to look at that passage in Acts chapter 2 uh, that talks about being baptized and receiving the Holy Spirit in that sense. We're also going to look at those two passages in Acts chapter 16, uh, the baptism of Lydia and the baptism of the um, Philippian jailer. So we're going to look at those those three texts. Really, it's going to be four texts, and we're going to throw a bonus one in there just so that we have a good understanding of baptism or as best understanding as we can. Okay, So let's go ahead and jump in. We're going to start with Matthew uh, chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. I've got this on uh, two different slides. Uh, just so the font is bigger. But chapter 3, verse 13 says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. But John tried to stop him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus answered him, Allow it to be, or allow it for now, because this is the way for us to fulfill the righteousness. Then he allowed him to be baptized, or allowed him to yeah, allowed him to be baptized. And verse 16 continues on and says, After Jesus was baptized, he went up immediately from the water, and the heavens suddenly opened for him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming down on him. And there was a voice from heaven, This is my beloved Son, and I take delight in him. Him, all right. So when we look at the the, the baptism of Jesus, and we look at um, what the the story is actually telling us, um, we see Jesus. He goes to John to be baptized, and John's real hesitant to do this. Honestly, um, I think we all would have been had we recognized who Jesus was. We, whoa, I, th I think this needs to be reversed. And John's real hesitant to do this, but Jesus tells him, "Let's this needs to be done." All right. So let's do this, and let's make sure that we are righteous in doing this. And so they. John baptizes him. Um, and so when we look at that, there's some uh, very interesting points that we need to kind of point out or that stand out to us in the story. Right? First of all, when Jesus is baptized, he is an adult when he is baptized. All right. Um, and so you say, well, what difference does that make? It makes kind of a significant difference. If we're going to say that um, Jesus instituted or commands these things to be done, um, if he sets the example for them to be done, then maybe we should do it like he did it. Maybe we should follow his example. And so Jesus was an adult because he has a conversation with John. In fact, even um, those that believe in pedo baptism wouldn't argue this. They would say that Jesus was probably around the age of 30, uh, maybe give or take a couple years, depending on how you count or who's guessing. Um, but there's no question that when Jesus was baptized, he was baptized as an adult. Okay? Um, they would also, something also interesting is that Jesus was immersed underwater. All right? Now, this is going to become a bigger conversation for us. Uh, when we get to the mode of baptism, but Jesus was dunked, and we know that um, he was fully immersed because the language says, one, baptized, and two, uh, when he came up out of the water, which means that he had to be in the water 
to come up out of the water. All right. So that's going to become more of a conversation for us. All right. So if we are looking at the example of Jesus as what we should do for baptism, then we got to ask this question. If baptism is for receiving grace and for washing away sins, then does that apply to Jesus? Did Jesus need to receive grace? Did Jesus need to have the original sin washed away? Right? And I don't know of any Christian who's comfortable saying yes to either one of those, that Jesus didn't need to receive grace from his Father. Um, he had grace, um, nor would anybody feel comfortable saying that he needed to be washed from original sin. Okay? Um, in fact, you could even make an argument that that um, he didn't have an earthly father, so the original sin of Adam doesn't apply to him. There's a whole conversation there that we won't get into in this time because it would take up way more time than we have. Um, but Jesus doesn't need grace, nor does he need washing from original sin. So it doesn't seem like those either of those would be the reason for him being baptized. It seems more likely that he's going to be baptized because it gives us a beautiful picture about his future ministry of his death and resurrection. Right? The last thing is uh, that Jesus nor John mentioned circumcision or this being a replacement for circumcision. Right? Uh, our best guess is that since Jesus and John were both Jewish, um, since they came from Jewish families, that both of them would have been circumcised already. And so neither of them in this conversation that happens in any of the four Gospels mention anything about circumcision or this being a replacement for circumcision. None of that is discussed in the baptism of Jesus. So if we're going to say that baptism was instituted by Jesus, it was commanded by Jesus, then we got to look at how Jesus was baptized and let that be a determining factor for us. Okay. In fact, we're going to take that a step further, and this is the bonus passage I told, we were, told you we were going to look at. Um, in Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15 is the Jerusalem Council, and circumcision is the, the question, right? Do we require circumcision for those who are not circumcised, right? So if someone um, wants to become a Christian, do we make them be circumcised first? Do they have to become a good Jew before they become a good Christian, right? So we're talking about folks that are Gentiles, that are not following the Jewish laws. Um, this would be most of us, Okay. Do we require them to go through circumcision or do we not? That's the question of Acts chapter 15. And so if you read that text, um, there is no mention of baptism anywhere in that discussion. Okay, um, There is no part of that text that says, no, no, listen, um, for you guys that are Jews, you keep your circumcision. For you guys that are Baptist, or uh, excuse me, that are Gentiles, just be baptized. And that'll mark you as a covenant member, okay? That'll be the same. We don't have that conversation. In fact, the only thing you do have that's, that has the, what they're asking is Acts chapter 15, verse 29. says that if you will abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that's been in, in, or strangled, or from sexual immorality, uh, you will do well if you keep yourselves from these things, okay? And so what we find is is that in the text where if there was a connection between baptism and circumcision, if there was a connection between one replacing another, this is where it should have been. And neither John nor Jesus discussed this replacement. The Jerusalem Council doesn't discuss this as a replacement option, as this new covenant seal. None of that. In fact, there is no text that, that I'm aware of. Um, there's no text anywhere in the New Testament that is connecting or relating baptism to circumcision, right? There, there's not a text that connects those two or equates those two. It says, well, this is the Old Testament version of this, or this is the New Testament version of that. We don't have that in Scripture, okay? So the idea that one is a replacement of the other, we have a hard time backing that up, all right, with Scripture. So now let's go to Acts chapter 2, uh, and we're going to expand because uh, the text I showed you earlier just looked at one verse, uh, verse 38, but we want to expand that out. We want to expand it and look at a better context of it. So we're going to expand it to verse 37 all the way through verse 41. Verse 37 says, When they heard this, they came under deep convictions and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Verse 38. This is the verse we read earlier. Repent. Peter said to them, And be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as are the Lord 
our God will call. And with many others words, excuse me, and with many other words, he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. In verse 41, So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added to them. Right? So I want you to see a couple things as we point out this passage of Scripture. One, again, you have adult males okay, uh, coming into the temple to, to hear Peter. Um, and there may have been females in there. I shouldn't have said adult males. Just they're adults. And they are questioning Peter. All right? They ask this question in the rest of the apostles. Brothers, what must we do? All right. So you have someone who's old enough to, to understand what's going on. You have someone who's old enough to question what do I have to do now? And Peter's response to them is repent and be baptized. Okay? So repentance comes before the baptism. Right? And notice down in verse 41, and those who accepted his message were baptized. It does not say they baptized everybody and then a couple years later they went through a confirmation class and then they accepted the teachings. That's not what it says. The, the order is clear. Repent and be baptized, and those who accepted the message were baptized. Right? So the order there is very, very clear. And by the way, this also goes against what we heard just a few moments ago about the covenant, that any time an adult male or an adult that was the head of the household or became saved, his household automatically got baptized as well. Uh, we don't necessarily know that's the case because here we have three thousand people being saved all of them accept the the message um and so there's a good chance that somebody got saved and then went home and there was no follow-up there was no baptism of the household right um there's a good chance that uh, one spouse became bapt or became a, a christian at this point and received the holy spirit and got baptized uh, but the rest of their family didn't so we cannot make the statement that was made earlier that every baptism um, results in a household baptism because we don't know that to be true of this case. So let's look at those cases that they do say um, were of baptism. Oh, sorry, I forgot I had this slide. Um, again, adults were asked the question. Repentance precedes baptism. Um, they accepted his message before they were baptized. And so again, we would say that since infants cannot repent, nor accept the message, they should not be baptized. Okay, following the example of what we have in Scripture. Right? So now, let's go to the passages in Acts chapter 16. Right? These passages, um, talking about the um, institu this incorporation into the covenant. All right, And that's why we were baptized. And so the, we're going to the argument that says that every time there was a... Um, a person, an adult saved, their household was saved as well. Okay, um, And so we look at the Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. This is the woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyra, uh, who worshipped God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was spoken by Paul. After she and her household were baptized, she urged, saying, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house and she persuaded us. This is Paul talking here, okay? So uh, Lydia and her household, yes, they are baptized, okay? But what's interesting is that when we look at that text, um, the text does not tell us that infants were part of the household, okay? And, and so we got to kind of take this in context that if we're going to say that Lydia baptized infants, we don't know that because we don't know that there were infants in her household. In fact, her household could literally just be her and her husband. All right? uh, there's a good chance that her household could be her um, and her adult children. All right? um, we don't know. We don't know who is included in her household. So we cannot automatically say that her household included infants that were baptized because we don't know that. All right? The other interesting thing about that text is that Lydia is a female, which would exclude her from the laws of circumcision of the Old Testament. Okay, So the idea that this replaces circumcision of the Old Testament, well, now you have a lady who is a believer who didn't fall under the laws of the Old Testament for circumcision anyway, but now you're going to require her, or you're going to ask her to be baptized. 
So if baptism is replacement for circumcision, that would mean that we should not um, baptize females because females were not circumcised in the Old Testament. It was a covenant, a seal only to the male heirs, only to the males of the nation of Israel. And so if we're going to equate these two together, then let's be fully equivocal with the two, that it only applies to males in the Old Testament would mean that we should only apply it to males in the New Testament as well. All right? So then we're going to look at the last text uh, that they would point to, and that's the text of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16, verses, again, we're going to expand this out, 29 through 34. Um, in verse 29, it says, Then the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And so they escorted him. Oh, excuse me, sorry, verse 30. Verse 31. Uh, so they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the message of the Lord to him, along with everyone in his household. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all of his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had believed God with his entire household. Okay, So this is the text they're going to point to, and they're going to say um, that, see, we have another example of, a, of uh, someone being baptized and then their whole household being baptized as well. Okay, So again, if we look carefully at the text, there's a couple things we need to point out. One, this text, just like the other text um, in Acts chapter 16, it does not tell us who was in his family or who was in his household. Okay, We cannot make the argument for infant baptism if we don't know infants were part of the household. Um, and since it doesn't tell us that, we can't make that conclusion. All right? In fact, um, if we're going to allow that conclusion, I'm going to make another conclusion that would say if he's the head jailer that can take a prisoner from the jail to his house, I'm going to say that he's a retired military official, um, and probably he has no young children in his house. All right? he, he may have some older children in his house. He may have some servants in his house that would constitute a household. But my guess is that he doesn't have any young children. All right? And Now, I honestly cannot back that up with Scripture, but neither can we back up the idea that this household included infants because Scripture doesn't tell us either of those things are explicitly true. We can imply one or the other, but we cannot read beyond what the text tells us. And so what we tell the text tells us is that him and his family or his household became Christians. Right? It does not tell us who was in his family. It does tell us that they rejoiced because everyone had believed. Right? And so it does tell us that there wasn't an infant who got baptized and then they're all rejoicing because the infant's going to believe one day. It is very clear it is past tense in that passage. In fact, let's go back to that passage just so we can have clarity of it. Um, in that last passage, he brought them to his house and set a meal before them and rejoiced because he had believed God and his entire household past tense. And notice all the way back um, in verse 32, then they spoke the message of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. Okay, So everyone in the house heard the message, believed, and were baptized. We don't have um, anyone who's being baptized who didn't hear the message and didn't believe and didn't receive the message. Okay, The last thing about that text um, that we kind of need to point out is that Paul only says that belief, not baptism, is required for salvation. Okay, That if you'll believe then you will be saved, you and your household, because we know that you're going to take this message back to your household. And we know that God's going to take us to your household to do this. He doesn't say baptism is essential or required for salvation. It is an obedience thing that we do versus something that's required for us to do. Because if baptism is required for salvation, then Paul didn't tell the full truth. Because what would happen... If the Philippian jailer said, great, I believe, I'm done, then Paul would have left him not with a full salvation if he didn't tell him 
about baptism. Right now, clearly, he told him about baptism, um, but that's not. He doesn't say that's what's required for the text. Okay, so if we have this question of infant baptism versus believers' baptism, we have these conclusions that we can reach by looking at the text. All right. First of all, Christ uh, does not institute or ordain or start infant baptism. If we're going off the example of Christ, Christ was an adult. Christ never baptizes an infant. Christ doesn't condone the baptism of infants. Uh, Christ never speaks of the baptism of infants. The closest thing you have is Christ um, allowing the children to come to Him, but it doesn't mention baptism at all. And so if we're going to say that we're going to go with what Christ instituted, then let's do that. But Christ did not institute, he did not participate, he did not take part in, he never baptized an infant, he was not baptized as an infant. And so if we're going to say that this is something Christ instituted, let's do it through the way that Christ himself instituted. Second cl conclusion we're going to say is that the practice of the apostles was to baptize believers, not unbelievers. Okay, So for all the examples that we looked at in Scripture, Every example is clear in the pattern that someone believed and then they were baptized. That they heard the message, they accepted the message, and then they were baptized. Nowhere in Scripture do we have anyone who is baptized and then hears the message of the gospel later. Right? None of the apostles in none of the gospels or, or excuse me, none of the apostles in Acts or any of their letters are going to baptize before someone is a believer. They do not baptize unbelievers. Uh, an interesting quote is I found this article uh, backing uh, infant baptism and it started out by saying this, that can you give me a Bible verse on infant baptism? And the admission of the person who wrote it says no, because there is no Bible verse that says baptize infants. Right? Um, so I'll take that, I'll, I'll add to what he said. He says there are also no verse that says don't do it. Right? But if we're going to let the Bible be our guide, there's no verse that says do it, nor are there any direct examples of it in the Bible whatsoever. Okay, We don't see anywhere in the Bible um, directly where a, an infant was baptized. Jesus doesn't do it. John's not doing it. None of the apostles are doing it. There is no direct evidence anywhere in Scripture for an infant being baptized. All right? um, you're, if you go with that route, it's because you're reading into a text about a household that could or could not include infants in it, right? But there is no direct reference, no direct scripture, no direct example of this being the case. So if we're going to do an ordinance that's instituted by Christ and practiced by the apostles, then let's do it the way they did it. Let's stick with just baptizing the believers. And the last thing is that baptism is a result of salvation, not a contributor to it. Okay. Again, the practice was always repent, believe, accept, then they were baptized. Right? Never do we see baptism leading to the salvation or causing the salvation of someone else. It is always in response to the salvation that has already happened. They already believed, they already accepted, they already confessed, they already repented, then they were baptized. Right? It is always in that order, and baptism doesn't produce salvation. It is the result of it. We do it because we are saved. We do it because we have the grace of Christ. We don't get grace from it. We do it the other way. Okay, And so part of the reason this is such a big deal for Baptists, and part of the reason this is um, so uh, such a Baptist distinctive is because if we are true in our idea of Baptist uh, of uh, believer's baptism, then there's several implications that come with that. All right? First of all, this really does away with the need for a separate confirmation. Okay, If you're not practicing infant baptism, then you don't need a separate confirmation process or class to go through. Now, that doesn't mean we don't disciple. It just means that we don't have another point in our life where we have to make a decision because we made the decision to be a follower of Christ then we followed up with baptism. By the way, there is no reference to confirmations in Scripture at all. All right, there's there's no pattern of confirmation classes. The best you could do is again equate that to an Old Testament standard of a bar mitzvah or a, um, a, a bar mitzvah where a, a young man um, made the decision to be a man or made the decision to uh, follow the Jewish laws. Okay. That would be the best connection you can have, but that doesn't equate to a New Testament, New Covenant, 
new law idea. All right, we don't have to have this kind of confirmation class going on because we don't need a second confirmation. Your baptism alone is confirmation that you believe these things, that you are living this lifestyle. And so it really does away with the need for a separate confirmation. The baptism is the confirmation. The second implication is that church membership then is reserved only for those that are truly saved. Okay, So um, just like we, we talked about, even with infant baptism, Baptism is the key to church membership, right? So in any of those, even infant baptism, um, you're gonna, they're going to become a member of that church, okay? Um, so you're going to have people who are members of your church who may not necessarily be saved people, okay? Now, for some folks, that doesn't make a difference because they say, oh, well, confirmation, uh, they don't really have any say, they don't really have any authority um, until they get through confirmation at the age of 13 or so. And so they would say, well, that's not a problem. But um, what you do have is folks that are church members um, who are then in a position who are, um, who are not saved. And so they have this struggle um, because how then do you differentiate between someone who is saved and a member of your church and someone who's a member of your church and not saved? Do you kick them out uh, after they um, choose not to go through confirmation or after they choose not to follow through with another ordinance or even if you don't consider it an ordinance or a sacrament, um, do you take them off your membership role? Okay? And the reason, again, that this is so important for us is because for us as Baptists who believe in an autonomous church, this provides the accountability within the church itself, okay? So um, for us who are Baptists, we believe in the autonomy of the church. We don't have a, a denomination telling us or, or controlling us. What we have is us making decisions as a local church. Well, there's a problem if us making those decisions have within our midst people who do not have the same confessions and beliefs that we do. If, if within our church... We have folks that are not saved, baptized, filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the regener and a new heart. If they become the decision makers of our church, that's a problem. Um, and so that's what can happen if we allow membership for folks who are not just saved, baptized people. And so it protects our membership, but it also protects the accountability within an autonomous church. All right. Um, and so this also eliminates the need for any other mode of baptism, right? And we're going to talk about that in just a moment, but simply put, you wouldn't need to baptize by any other method other than immersion if you weren't baptizing by adults. In fact, that's really um, infant baptism and possibly handicapped baptism is the only reason to justify any other type of baptism besides immersion. So let's jump into that, uh, that conversation really quick, and I promise it's going to be short, sweet, and to the point. When we look at the modes of baptism, um, they are important for us, but not as important as what we believe about uh, believer's baptism. Believer's baptism carries so many implications that go just beyond just, hey, yeah, here's what we think about baptism. It carries through to how we govern our church. It carries through to our membership of our church, to how we would uh, discipline a church member. Um, it would carry through into uh, what follows after baptism. Are we going to require a confirmation or are we not? It really does, and that's the reason this is such a distinctive for us, is because this really does play into everything else we do. All right, It is, it is kind of a ground-based foundation for us. So now let's jump to the mode, and we're going to do this. There's only a few parts of this we need to discuss. But there are really three modes or methods of baptism. There's immersion, which is completely submerged. There's effusion, which is basically pouring water uh, over someone. And there's aspiration, which is the sprinkling. All right? um, these last two of effusion and aspiration are really more common uh, with those who practice infant baptism. And so you may have seen both of those. Sprinkling is just that. You, you uh, the priest will dip his fingers into holy water and sprinkle it on someone. A fusion is, is fairly typical with someone who's an infant. They will lower the child, uh, kind of hold them uh, somewhat slightly inverted, and they'll pour water just slightly on the top of their head, and then they'll let it run back down over their head that way versus down in their face. All right? So they're pouring that off. Okay? They'll do that um, 
because they will say that's the washing away or the pouring out of the Spirit, if you will. Okay, um, So, these last two, like I said, became really common for those that practice infant baptism, mainly for practical reasons. Right? And, and because it, it's really um, interesting to think about emerging an infant. However, there are some, the Eastern Orthodox, some Catholics, and even some Methodists will allow you to fully immerse an infant, which literally would mean that you take an infant and you fully dunk them underwater. Head, nose, everything is completely submerged. Okay, So part of the reason uh, that infant baptism or sprinkling or effusion became so popular is because if we're going to baptize infants, it really looks bad if we take this infant and dunk it underwater. It may choke, it may drown, it may um, uh, inhale some of the water. So let's just pour it over its head. And it was more of a practical reason than a theological reason, more of a practical reason than a, a biblical reason to do that. Now, there are those that would say, well, aspiration is the pouring, it's the washing away, and they'll draw that connection. But it's really more of the convenience factor than anything else. And so we would say that baptism needs to be by immersion, okay? And the reason for that is because the Greek word bapto, baptize or baptizo does mean to immerse. It doesn't mean to sprinkle. It doesn't mean to pour over. It means to fully submerse. If someone was baptized, that's what happened to them. Um, again, and we're going to say that Jesus was fully immersed. He came up out of the water, meaning he was in the water. And so if this is a, an ordinance instituted by Christ, then that's what we need to do. All baptisms in the New Testament were by immersion. We don't have any example in the New Testament of anybody being sprinkled or being poured over. None of those. In fact, um, even the, the Ethiopian eunuch that we have that example, um, there's enough water here. What prevents me from being baptized now? Nothing. Let's do this. Let's do this now because there's enough water to immerse that person completely in. Okay, um, And so immersion is the every baptism in the New Testament is by immersion. Immersion gives the best picture of the gospel. Um, and so if we're going to say this is a picture of the gospel, then immersion really gives that best picture. It is the, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We see all three of those kind of depicted in an immersion situation. When the pastor says, um, gets ready, and they, they put them, most of the time they'll say, buried with Christ, raised in new life, all right? So it is a very real picture of Christ going into the tomb and rising again from it. So it is a picture of the gospel, and immersion gives us that better picture than any other picture of um, aspiration or, um, or, excuse me, of sprinkling or pouring. And the last thing is that it's the best picture of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, where it talks about us, the old being passed away, the new coming, and, and so those that are, are uh, saved are a new creation. And so for us, that's the best picture of a new creation, of something born again, something coming out of death, something coming fresh and new. Okay. Oddly enough, it was also the practice um, of the early Christian church. And so we don't necessarily uh, use that as the full example, the full reason we do it. We do it biblically, not on church history. Uh, but for the early, early church, this is how they baptized. In fact, they baptized as adults in a river. And when someone came out of the waters, uh, they were given a brand new robe to picture that passage we just talked about in Corinthians. We're talking about being a new creation. I am made new. This is the garment that I am wearing now. Um, I, I'm putting on... Christ. I've, I've taken all the other stuff off. I've let it wash away, and I'm putting on Christ. So we don't get that same picture with sprinkling or with pouring, but man, that's a beautiful picture of the gospel, a beautiful picture of redemption, beautiful picture of what Christ does for us um, and did for us through his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So we would say that if we're going to picture, um, if we're going to allow um, baptism to be a picture of the gospel, then let's have the best picture we can, and immersion is the best picture we have. All right? So that's it for baptism. That's why we believe in believer's baptism. Uh, it is the biblical example that we have. It also uh, has the implications, uh, that how we govern our church. And we baptize believers, and we baptize them by immersion because it's the best picture of the gospel that we have of all the methods. methods. So thanks for joining us. Um, we'll, we'll have a, a next week. We'll talk about the Lord's Supper.
and how we view it uh, and why we do it as often as we do versus other churches that do it more often and some that may do it even less often than we do. All right? So thanks so much. We look forward to seeing you next week.